Well, thanks, Neat, and uh, thanks to Nemsi for the opportunity to talk with everybody today. Um, and I do appreciate that you're taking your lunch hour, or early lunch hour, or maybe your late breakfast hour um, to spend time with us. And um, and I uh, have the opportunity to talk to you about doing skills practice. And the this is something that I've always been interested in, especially as I got into education. Part of it was that um, when, I, I, so I'm a dinosaur. And so when I first started and did my initial training, much of, much of it was hands-on and there was book knowledge as well. But I would say that we probably spent well over half of our time in various types of labs um, and, and getting our skills together. And then when I entered the um, education system again, first as a full-time instructor, then as a program director and seeing how the evolution of the of the uh, curriculum occurred, the, uh, the, the amount of time that, um, I don't know about you, but the amount of time that's allotted to um, practice often falls below 50%. And in at least the unofficial, unscientific surveys that I've done over the years, it seems like many programs that are around 30 to 40% of their clock time is done in, in, um, in lab. So, uh, the, so I wanted to come up with ways that would be more efficient and more effective in terms of, um, you know, the, the minimal amount of time that we have to cover uh, skills specifically um, to, to acquire those skills uh, that given the amount of time that we have for it, how effective could I make it happen? Uh, and uh, what principles could I follow? to help improve my, not my ability alone, but certainly the, the skills instructors that I work with um, to help improve their effectiveness as instructors um, so that students can get these skills underneath their belts early uh, and, uh, and get gain that confidence so that when they go into uh, scenarios or they go into simulations and then ultimately uh, in with live patients that they can um, function uh, fairly adequately at that that competent entry level that we all look for. Um, so these will be the questions I'm going to try to cover over the next 45 minutes. Um, thanks for people who have put in uh, sort of where they're coming from. And certainly, if you uh, have any questions, please put them in the questions box or drop in the chat. I'll try to look here every once in a while to make sure that I can try to address them best as I can. Um, and I'll leave time at the end uh, of the presentation. So if you do have questions, we can certainly chat about those at that particular point. And I think Nate's gonna have my email address um, that uh, if you wanna have follow-up, more than happy to talk to you about some of the stuff that we're doing here at the JC. Um, so, you know, uh, Vince Lombardi, uh, <laughs> this might be one of those Johnny and Roy things where people were becoming less and less familiar with uh, folks from the 60s and 70s. Um, but, you know, he was a, a fairly famous um, uh, uh, football coach, but ultimately uh, one of the one of the first uh, or one of the earliest uh, motivational speakers that were out there um, back in that time. And in, and his this, this one quote is is um, attributed to him where he basically says, you know what, practice is fine, but it doesn't make perfect. And you really have to have perfect practice to make perfect. Um, and I think these days, uh, what we try to do is to, you know, we talk about practice as you preach um, or practice as you play and play as you practice. Uh, and um, and we, you know, really want to make sure that what we train in the classroom ends up transferring appropriately into the field with with uh, live patients. And so in order to do that, there's a certain amount of, of repetition and and guidance of practice that if you can get it, them off on the right foot and get your students off on the right foot, they tend to get better and get very solid in their skills and then practice and then then implement them in the field conversely if you're not really um helping them practice you're not really guiding their practice and getting them off on the right foot they can get off on the wrong foot and you can actually train in poor technique and it's important that your ability to do evaluations to make sure that you can correct it on the fly 
um, and corrected um, at critical times during the program, i.e. during skills exams or final exams, that you're able to, um, you are able to, to identify uh, those trained in weaknesses and correct them before they go out to the field. Uh, so um, the, the, you know, just sort of baseline the idea of, of having skills, uh, the psychomotor skills, and, and the is um, based on the fact that it's uh, with both cognitive information or the knowledge base that they have to have in order to implement the skill, as well as the effective domain um, having to come in to understand why, uh, why it's important and um, what some of the criticalities associated with that particular skill. So it stands to make sense that you never really teach a skill in a void. Um, it, there's always information that you end up providing to the students. And so for cognitive information, um, it's, it's, it is important that you have a baseline of knowledge that the students should have before they start practicing the skill. Um, so from a sequencing perspective, you know, it, it makes sense that whether it's a pre-assigned reading or video or uh, something that, that basically can get their heads around what, they're what they can anticipate picking up during the skills lab, getting that in front of them, uh, giving them a little bit of time to process that information um, is helpful. It also appeals to your students that have that learning style in which they really want to have that information up front before they get started. So you wanna make sure that that background information is relevant. You know, you wanna answer the how and the why question. So um, again, for students that really need to have those things in place before they can go, okay, now I understand why I'm gonna really do this, or I, I, I've, I've seen the video, I've read the instructions, I'm a very linear thinker and I, and I like, you know, things in sequence. And so I have that in my head before I actually start and watch you, the instructor practice, uh, and then practice on my own. So, um, and these days, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this, uh, the University of YouTube is a great place to find um, um, training materials and, you know, Khan Academy has information there as well. And, and there are plenty of programs that are putting their own stuff up on the web. And uh, as opposed to 10 years ago, where it was kind of haphazard or it was kind of hit and miss in terms of how accurate or how clean or how how good it looked, um, you know, these days it's, it's fairly easy to find good stuff. Um, and, uh, and it may not be perfect, uh, or it may not be exactly how you do it in your environment, uh, but you can make those distinctions within the, you know, you said, hey, this is great video. This is one thing that they do that we don't do here, but uh, I'll sh we'll show you how, to, uh, how we do that piece here, right? So you can always qualify uh, what they're seeing uh, and it would help, uh, and again, sort of helps that visual learner. Um, the, the appeal to the, to the motivator, motivator is important. You know, the, there's, there's a lot of information that's provided in EMT and in paramedic classes. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, paramedic programs in particular feel, the students often feel like they're drinking from a wide open fire hose, um, and they're always prioritizing what, what's really important, what do I really need to know, what I think I don't really need to know. Meanwhile, you know, we're putting out all that information because we know that that's key information that they have to have in order to function appropriately in the field. EMTs, the story is very similar. So, um, so when it comes to skills, you, you have to make sure that you're spending enough time convincing them that this is going to be important. Normally, that's not a big issue because most of our students have at least kinesthetic learning under their belt. They appreciate learning hands-on and they really want to um, go in that particular direction. Uh, but you will occasionally have those students that are a little bit more academic, a little bit um, less uh, associ associating learning with, with hands-on stuff and really having to convince them that this is important. If they can grasp the concept that it's a critical skill, um, like we don't teach you non-critical skills, like every skill we teach you is a critical skill. Um, but in order, you know, to, to be, to, to coach them, to get them to understand if you're doing this correctly, other things fall into place are, um, you know, those are like little ticklers that gets them, uh, attentive and, 
and and really um, try their best to acquire that skill for the first time. Um, so acquisition step acquisition steps um, there in uh, not just in EMS but just in any um, in any technical field where there's a there's procedures uh, and and um, and basically hands on um, therapeutics that need to happen. Uh, there are a series of steps that you can measure and you can define, uh, and uh, it's it's it, it's no secret, and it certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, the from the point of imitation that moves to manipulation to to being to practicing those skills until they're precise, um, be able being able to articulate them into simulations and scenarios uh, and to be able to work beyond that. And then to the point where they become a very natural, uh, not thinking process that frees up the brain to do other things. Um, that's sort of the naturalization process. So um, in our world, or at least in my world, um, imitation starts the process. It's the do as I do and say, right? This means that when you're doing this initial step and you're demonstrating the the process you know whether it's a blood pressure measurement or whether it's um, iv access or uh, even patient assessment that's a little bit more difficult but certainly these other very well-defined skills um, you have to make sure that how how you are going to show them the big picture each of the steps that you you want to be able to show them as perfectly as possible um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been doing this for a while and I still will F it up on occasion. And so I, um, I want to make sure that before I do and, and demonstrate a skill, or if I have skills instructors demonstrating those skills that we do them beforehand, um, that we practice that first before we actually demonstrate it in front, because it's really um, nothing more confusing to a student than if you're starting to work your way through a procedure and suddenly realize you're making a mistake. Um, they go, oh, that was, you know, that, that's not the way to do it. Why don't you do it this way? That really can confuse some students uh, and, uh, and they may not pick up on it. Amazingly, you know, students, they're so focused and they, they want to get it right. So if, since they don't know what's not right, they will pick up any mistakes that you put in there, right? And so, so you want to make sure in this sort of first step that when they are learning it for the first time, that if you're demonstrating a specific procedure, that you show it as perfectly as you can, which means that you want to be ready to practice. And then when they start to practice for that first time on those skills, you want to have a lot of eyes on um, the students as they practice that first skill. So you can correct all the micro mistakes that happen um, when they're learning it for the first time and just correct it right then and there and just help them get through that particular process. And I'll elaborate on that just in a little bit. Um, under manipulation, this is where they, uh, once they kind of have started to, uh, they, they've seen it and they've worked through it very slowly, this is still within that same lab perhaps, or within the lab that's next, is where they start to have practice. And again, I'll show you uh, what I mean by that. Um, and it's guided practice where you're working to, um, again, to make sure that there's enough experienced uh, and practiced instructors who can help, so help regulate the flow of the practice and help identify the weaknesses as they occur and they reoccur, um, being able to coach their way, uh, coach the students up through the process. Those are the key things that are, are really important. Don't, don't just show it once and allow the students to then practice because that's when mistakes are built, are, are baked right into the process. So um, that first period of time could be the first few minutes, it could be the first few hours, it could be the first full day, depending on the, the difficulty of the skill. Um, it, may, it may take time um, and you wanna make sure that you have enough resources available to you 
in order to make sure that they get it right the first time. Once you're happy with that, uh, you're, you, you know, so an instructor has, has seen a student work their way through the first time and it looks really good. It's not totally perfect, but it's pretty close. Uh, and meaning that they've got all the steps down, but it's taking them a long time to make it happen and that's okay in the first um, period, then this is where the practicing on their own kicks in, right? Don't let them get to this point without having eyes on, eyeballs on their process to make sure that they're doing it correctly. If they're doing it correctly, according to whatever measurement that you have set for that skill um, is the only time when they should be practicing on their own. Right. So for for, you know, accredited programs, you know that this is the this is the peer driven part of the lab report where they're recording um, their each of their processes. Uh, each time that they're practicing a particular step, they uh, a fellow student checks them off. And um, and this is where you can develop precision. Right. And so for programs, you're you're setting your numbers in terms of how how many how many practices should they do at IV sticks? How many practices should they do at intubations? Um, the key in precision, the, the key part in this is that you're still, even though you may not be necessarily standing by the student, you're still, you're still providing direction at this point, right? You're still correcting errors in setup. So like, for example, if it's uh, airway management, right? Endotracheal intubation or bagging a, a patient, Right. We, we want them to follow. We, we use a skill sheet that has from the beginning where they start with the assessment of the patient's airway and they work their way down. What we don't want them to do is to jump right to intubation, for example, and miss sort of the, the prep and the critical decision steps as to what they're going to do. And um, if if they if they if I see if I see a student jump immediately to go I'm just as how I'm going to do an intubation they're done in 30 seconds and they get a check that doesn't count because it's not the skill and that's why I tell them it's like the intubation is not the skill it's airway management and this is the skill sheet for airway management in which intubation is part of but you need to show all of the steps before you can actually get a check off from a student and and we do this correction probably a couple of times during the first few labs and then it it tends to go away, um, the, the, the urge to just get to the fun part, the fun part of the procedure. Um, so uh, the, the, that's the precision piece. So it's independent practice and it's limited basically to, to very specific conditions like a lab. So articulation is performing with awareness. Um, so as they move out of precision and they're moving into articulation, what they're now starting to do are things like scenarios or simulations in the lab, um, or they're moving into the clinical aspect and they're in the hospital, for example, practicing their IV starts, or they're in the OR practicing their um, intubations under guidance with, with nurses or, or anesthesiologists or, or NRPs. So um, the this is where you're really working with um, you're really working with people who are, uh, uh, they've got all the skill practice down, so they know the mechanics really well, and now they're starting to adapt it to the situation that they're in. And this is a transition piece for them. So this is where they're starting to make adaptations because, you know, the, the mannequin is, is now sort of in a different position, or the patient is not sitting in a chair um, with an IV, but they're on a gurney, and they're in the you know they're they're on a hospital bed, so this is this is what we mean by articulation. Um, ultimately, what you want them to do is to get to naturalization, um, which is where they're so comfortable with the particular skill that they can perform una unaware. Um, and why this is so crucial? Because you want them to be able to do this while other parts of their brain are assembling the patient assessment, coming up with the differentials, doing the rule outs. And so where in, in situations where they have to be able to do both, um, and you see this with interns, paramedic interns often, um, where they, they have to microtask when they're doing the particular skill, and we want them to. 
but the what we also want them to be able to do is to do the setup and to be able to start moving in call progression those particular skills while they're still talking to the patient it sort of maximizes efficiency of of running the call and um and and establishing therapeutics for the patient so um so that so that so-called muscle memory becomes really important that's the baseline if they have a solid baseline doing skills in a routine situation they are more apt to be able to adapt them uh, out of context so if they have an un so for example an iv stick on 90 on 50 um, good solid patients with easy to identify veins helps them to identify the difficult one and um, and be successful at it, even though it may not look like or feel like what they're used to, but they're they've got that baseline down to be able to adapt. So, so those are sort of the acquisition st steps, um, and you can you can evaluate at each of those particular steps as you need to. Um, and then, so I want to talk a little bit about the concept of deliberate practice. Um, and deliberate practice is, uh, I've, I've been looking for sort of the origins of it, but it started, people started talking about it more precisely in the 60s. Um, ben Hogan, again, another name you may, may not be familiar, familiar with, was a, a famous golfer at that particular time. Um, sort of uh, refined the modern game of golf. Um, and um, more recent uh, people would be think people like Michael Jordan um, or um, Tiger Woods, or uh, even in the academic, uh, in academia, you, people like Bill Gates, for example. Um, and what they, uh, what, what they all had in common was that they, they, when they practiced whatever they were doing, they did it in a very deliberate way. They did it in a very, um, they had a very specific process. And the process varied from, from skill to skill, but it all had sort of the same process to that. And which is um, like a golf swing looks pretty fluid, but for those of you who play golf, you know that it's actually a myriad of steps that are connected together to give you the swing that hits the ball square that allows it to go in the direction you want it to go, or you hope anyway, right? And 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 good golfers can get it a, uh, a lot of the times, and great golfers seem to do it all of the time, right? And so, and what's the difference? You know, for the mo for for folks that seem to um, surpass what's you know good into great or into legendary, is really about practice, right? And there's plenty of stories out there about people like Tiger Woods, for example, or like Michael Jordan, who would, you know, practice for hours on end and practice the same step over and over again. So, you know, there's there's one story of Michael Jordan um, at the end of a game after finishing up, after everybody was gone, came back out to the court in the dark and practiced the shots that he missed. And he would do 50 to 100 of those shots um, just over and over and over again until he figured out how, why he missed it in the first place and then fixed it so he got better. Uh, and that, that's the idea of deliberate practice. And we do, you can do the same thing with your skills and it makes them very efficient. So breaking them down into discrete steps, understanding what each step means is important. Um, once you figure out those steps, you prioritize the steps. You figure out what step is actually most important. It's usually not the first one. There's usually a critical step that if you don't get this, the rest of the skill fails. There's usually one or two of those steps that are important. And so you practice those steps first. Um, and that allows you to have multiple practice attempts at the critical skills before putting everything together. And you don't really go forward until the student can show you that they have success in those critical steps. And then once the steps are all practiced, you connect them together. I know this seems like it's a long period of time, but I'll show you, um, I'll show you what that means. So for example, under spinal immobilization, um, this is a, an older uh, slide here, but 
So this was back when spinal mobilization was more critical. Uh, and I feel, still think it's a critical step today. I think actually we're seeing a swing back to um, whether or not we should be immobilizing patients. Um, and uh, this would probably be sort of a standard way that you would show, right? So in the lab, hey, the first thing I'm gonna show you is how to do manual stabilization. Then we're gonna show you how to size up a collar. Then we're gonna show you how to put on the collar. Then we're gonna show you manual stabilization. So we'll kind of go through step by step because the skill sheet looks like that, right? So it, in the brain, it feels like, well, I should just follow the skill sheet and then the students will practice through that piece, right? So. In deliberate practice, you look at this and you go, well, really, what's going to be, what, what are some of the critical steps that students tend to go wrong with um, that can cause significant potential problems in the field, right? And so in, we as skills instructors sort of worked our way through, and we decided that really what was most important was the log roll. And then we like, huh, what does that mean? Well, it's because if, if you if you can sort of figure out the log roll, which is a, a team approach that requires some coordination, and if you don't do it well, it's like excessive manipulation of the spine, that that's, could be problematic. And so that was a good place to start. Um, and that was a good place for them to, the, 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 these new students were working as a team to figure out how to coordinate their steps and do the log roll. Then putting them on the board was next. And because there was that whole scissoring thing as opposed to pushing them side to side, right? And that was a, that's a tough skill for, you know, moving a live body and it, and it takes a little bit for students to learn that. Then we came back and then let's practice sizing the cervical collar, just practicing putting it on, uh, and putting it in place and then manual stabilization. And then we kind of worked our way through this, right? And, and we practiced some things alone and then we practice them together. Um, and this, uh, this lab is about an hour long, right? So, um, in, in, so, and so what does that mean? It means that by the end of the hour, students, a group of students will have practiced log roll and placement of the board probably about 15 times, uh, 10 to 15 times. They would have practiced sizing the collar um, probably about 10 times. They would have practiced the other steps probably about eight times. So it gets to be a little bit less each one, but by the time they get to the end of the lab, they're able to run from beginning to end and they can do it relatively quickly because they've done that focus with that instructor there watching them go through that process. Um, another example would be blood pressure management, uh, blood pressure measurement and um, it, you know, it, it, it I, you know, it, it, back in the day when I first started, I probably did teach blood pressure management uh, measurement uh, similar to other people. Here, I have two students. I'm going to have them look at the cuff and we're going to blow it up. We're going to know how to check for a pulse and put the bell on the scope and we're going to sort of practice with each other. And 15, 20 minutes might go by and they may have done the skill once or twice, right? Maybe three times. Uh, each. Uh, and, um, and that was a lot of time spent on establishing how to, to take a manual blood pressure. So we, you know, a few of us got together and said, how could we increase the efficiency of this? Like how, how could we double or triple the throughput in terms of the practice opportunities? And so what we did was that we split the students into two lines. Two, they, they sat in chairs facing each other you can see people that are sort of on the right here. They're in one set of chairs, those that are on the left. And you can see that there's paper here. So, um, so they had pairs of students with each other, facing each other. And the first thing that we taught them was basically how to blow the, how to put the cuff on, blow it up, and then slow and slowly let it come down um, and I, we don't even have them check for pulses at that point. We don't even have the stethoscope on. We just watch them learn how to manipulate the little valve so the air leaked out at the right speed, right? That was sort of the key thing because we felt like, you know, that's the one that most students really struggled with trying to figure that out. And so they practiced with, they, each pair practiced with each other um, to do that. Then we had them 
um, put the bell of the stethoscope, make sure that their stethoscope was in their ears correctly. And then we had them just practice that, just listen, just listen for the sound as it comes in. Like we had everyone blow it up to 160. That I think was the arbitrary number we put. Um, and that's how we identified people that were hypertensive as well. Um, because they were like, Hey, I still hear the, I still hear the pulse at 160. Oh, well, gee, uh, hmm, maybe you should go see a doctor. Um, cause you're like 20. Uh, so, um, the, so they practiced and we connected these steps together until they kind of got it right. And you can see that there's the instructor on one side and then there's an instructor on the other side and they're just going up and down the rows to watch each pair work. And then she just kept going. So they practice that, right? And they do it back and forth. So both sides do it. Then what we do is then what, so once we've got that imitation piece down, now we wanna get into that manipulation piece. So uh, everybody on the left, I think it was, um, the, the person at the very end got up, moved over to this chair and everybody moved down one. And they all started, they all took blood pressures and they recorded them on a piece of paper, their own blood pressure, right? What was given to them, right? So, so uh, this student would record what this student measured for that. And then we gave them a, a time frame to this, like you got two minutes to, to get that person's blood pressure. Great. Get up, move to the next one. So everybody moved again and they, they took it again and then they did it again. And at, with each one, we sped, we, we narrowed the time frame. So we started with maybe two minutes, then it was like a minute and 45 seconds, and then a minute and 30 seconds, and a minute and 15 seconds. Just something, you know, a little bit of competition, a little bit of drive. And that really, you know, made this into a, an interesting game. And then we just reversed the process and did that there. And what that showed was at the end, students had numerous measurements of their blood pressure. You know, as you would guess, some of, there was always a little bit of variability. Occasionally, there were ones that were way out of the norm and probably were inaccurate. And that's how we would identify um, to make sure that all students walked away from this exercise, knowing how to take a, an accurate blood pressure. Um, uh, and you can do this with a lot of skills and it's fast and it gives people multiple opportunities to practice before they come in. We even do this with medical assessments. We, we have them in rows and they um, are take turns um, practicing um, asking questions. Uh, in this particular case, this was like history taking and they had a baseline series of questions to ask. And what we would do toward the end was like, okay, so the, the person who's receiving the questions, you've got the sheet in front of you. Those who are asking the questions, put your sheet down and try to ask the questions, right? The OPQRST and sample questions. Um, and that uh, worked out, again, sort of got them up to speed in a pretty short period of time. Um, so those are, those are different examples. And we've, we do this with IV, we do this with intubation um, and so forth. Um, oh, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of IV access, how you can do it a little bit on the cheap side and, and still get the practice in. Um, <clears throat> so deliberate practice, also leans into mastery learning. Uh, and, uh, and mastery learning just basically says that, uh, you know, it, you're not learning just for learning's sake, especially when it comes to um, interventions and skill work. Um, you, you want to learn into being a master at it. Uh, and there are key elements that are involved with mastery learning. Um, being able to clearly identify what the end goal is for the student, uh, you know, obtaining an accurate blood pressure uh, and, and breaking into the smaller, the information in smaller chunks don't have, this is why we try not to have the students for the first time practice as a skill from beginning to end, um, because especially with, again, difficult skills, there's tons of steps and it's really difficult to kind of remember them. So we want to chunk it down a little bit and go for the, for the primary chunks first and then add to it. Right. And that allows that uh, them to make those connections a little bit more quickly. You don't want people to progress forward, right? This isn't social promotion. 
Um, just because they spent the hour doesn't mean that they're ready to go. If they're not ready to go in the specified time frame, they need more help. You're going to need to figure out how to set it up. It may not have to be with you. If you've identified students that have already gotten to the mastery point where they can really practice on their own, um, those are the students that can help the other students um, get better at that. So peer peer assisted learning um, is, a, is a very effective way of making that happen. It's gonna be really crucial to give accurate and continuous feedback, right? And again, that's why for that first set of practices, you want an instructor there to be talking a lot to make sure that not only are they making corrections, but also affirming when students are doing it right. So again, yeah, that's it. That's great. Boy, that's much better than it was before, right? That's much more precise. Whatever you're using, but that again helps to validate for the student and starts to make this awkward feeling thing that they're doing become more comfortable. They become more confident in terms of of uh, that they're doing it correctly. Uh, when it comes to evaluation, having criterion referenced evaluations become important. So what it means is that you're that you're vetted on your skill sheets, that you agree that your instructors agree that these are the steps and what each step actually means. So there's, there's specific criteria um, associated with being successful on that skill. Uh, and those are kind of the key elements in terms of, of where you wanna make sure that if you are getting these things in place, it helps to promote mastery learning. Um, so in these communications, right, we basically talk about instruction and we talk about feedback, right, you sort of mentioned that. So training instructions, right, um, you know, again, try to come up with as many multiple modalities as you can. Uh, when you're doing the pre-lab uh, work and then during lab, you wanna make sure that the instructions are clear, uh, that they're succinct, they're consistent, and they're very specific. Well, you, so, you, you know, one of the things about in, uh, in terms of training our skills instructors is to say, during these time frames, please don't talk about war stories, please don't talk about options, please don't talk about shortcuts, please don't talk about stuff that happens in the field, don't say, well, this is what we're teaching you in class, but this is what you do in the field, right? Then if that's what we're doing in the field, that's what we should be teaching, right? Oh, well, we don't actually teach that because it's a series of shortcuts, which is a calculated risk, which I'm willing to take because I have experience. That's not the same as an entry level grad. And so, so we, we push very hard to make sure that the instructors avoid saying that and really focus on, it, which is why we give them the skill sheets, they get the lesson plan in advance. They know, especially those who come and teach with us on a regular basis, know that this is a day where it's like, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're all going to teach that skill. And then this is how we're going to evaluate them on that skill. So we all use the same parameters and there's no confusions for the student body. In feedback, um, as I mentioned before, you want to be motivating, appeal to the effective domain, you know, make people feel comfortable, make them feel confident. Uh, that they're doing it and if they're not doing it make them feel supported so that they you know my assumption is you will get this you might be the you know the total thumbs person coming into the program but we'll figure out a way to make this happen for you um and we do i mean most of the I, it's it's the people are very adaptable they'll figure it out it's done in real time you don't want to wait to the end of a skill you want to be there on top of that the only time in which you, you're going to avoid doing that is during evaluation, uh, where you really want the student to be able to perform the entire skill without any without any feedback um, during the skill itself, because in real life, they get no feedback during the skill. Um, the danger, uh, as I mentioned before, is teaching or talking about things while they're doing skill acquisition. It just takes them off their game. Right. It's, it, it's it's you can talk about it during a break. You can talk about it afterwards uh, once they've accomplished the basic line. When we come back and we do simulations of scenarios, those are good opportunities to go, hey, you know, this is something you might want to consider when you're out there or, or they're in their internship. But during the actual acquisition, try not to teach other than affirming what they are trying to learn at that particular point. It actually speeds up the process quite a bit. You're not you don't have a lot of dead time as, as the instructor starts yakking away on something that doesn't really help. <clears throat> uh, 
um, most of you are probably familiar that feedback, right, is 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 designed to be genuine. Um, you want it to be performance based, so don't just say good job. Say specifically, you know, that time, boy, that seemed to flow really well. Like you were earlier, you were stumbling over this step, but you, boy, you zoomed right past that. That's really great. Um, you know, so you want that feedback to be very precise and be very behavior focused. Over time, as they get better and better, they get to that they get to that precision point. You want to taper off the feedback, right? Because you want them to. You don't want to have any of that feedback, which was an aid up until that point, to become a crutch, right? So you don't want you don't want them to have to depend on that to know that they're doing well. You want that to be an internal driver that they know when things are going well. And when things are not, so they can make those corrections. Um, so evaluation. Uh, so let's we'll sort of focus on that a little bit. Um, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, so evaluation is to examine or judge carefully, by definition, right? It talks about like when you're when you're when you are evaluating students in their skill performance. You know what do you use um, to to check them off? And what do you use and how do, more importantly, how do your instructors come together so that they are um, not only looking at the same page, but they are also understanding what each of those steps are together, right? So referencing, so norm referencing your, or, or increasing inter-rater reliability of your instructors. Um, so uh, one thing to just point out, I, I think this is happening less now. I think most of us have good access to skill sheets. But if your program is focusing on, for example, national registry check sheets as your skill sheet, I would recommend that you don't use this. And the reason is because it doesn't provide enough specificity, right? Because um, so, you know, these are check sheets. These are just for an evaluator to go, did they position the immobilization device appropriately? Did they direct the movement of the patient onto the device without compromising integrity of the spine, right? It doesn't say how they did it. So it leaves that open to interpretation by both instructors as well as by evaluators, right? If, you know, you may be super lucky that all of your instructors are graduates of your program. They're all recent and they all sing from the same sheet because you've taught them that way. And that's really great. I'm going to suspect that the vast majority of us don't have that. Most of us are, are bringing on instructors that come from different programs, different backgrounds, different experience levels. And they're going to all bring different mindsets in terms of uh, or perspectives as to what each of these steps mean. So if you like, for example, I just pulled up a, an old older skill sheet from back in the day. Um, so this is so this one is the registry sheet. This is the same skill, and it takes this long for it to get through, right? But this talks about how what the precision is required. So so if we were to use this particular sheet. It would have, this is what we would hold the students accountable to, right? This is where we're establishing a standard in terms of what we think the training should be for students. And, and, I'm, and again, I'm not necessarily promoting any particular, I mean, I think this one's already out of print, but, um, but even if you develop your own, you want it to have enough specificity so that you can really grade the student. Like, yeah, I mean, you put the patient on the board, but you didn't use a diagonal slide into position, right? You, you just hustled the patient from left to right. And we've already talked about how difficult that that could set up for a lot of problems in terms of if we're worried, really worried about the integrity of the spine, right? And that gives you a point to, to focus in on, again, to help train that out of them and also to point out that that's the, that is the standard that you wanna hold them to. So, um, whatever sheets that you use, make sure that has enough specificity so it's clear to the student as well as the evaluator um, for what, the, what you want them to do. Um, keeping track, 
of their practice. Um, I, you know, I, a lot of programs use logbooks. Um, a lot of paramedic pro programs use third-party data-driven stuff like Platinum or FizDAP, or they build their own. Um, but you do want to keep track. Paramedic programs were required to keep track. But even if you're running an EMT program, you want them to con to to know. You you want to know that they have been practicing, they may not have been practicing with you, but they have been practicing these steps so that there's evidence that they've really worked on trying to get um, precision um, in, to get to that particular point of precision. When you're evaluating, you wanna to get to this. So when you're evaluating, you wanna make sure that you are using a neutral body language and voice. The reason is that you know students key into behaviors your behaviors. And so if you really want them to show you that they know what they're doing, what you don't want to do is to give them un, um, unspoken feedback, uh, like, you know, crossing your arms or shaking your head or making a sigh or doing things that would suggest that they're not doing it correctly, right? Because then they'll, they, they potentially can make corrections in those areas. And then you don't know whether or not they identified it themselves or whether you triggered that. And so having a neutral body language and voice is important. Um, having a check sheet that everyone agrees upon is important. Um, and uh, and it, depending on whether or not you're a critical junction where there's sort of a summative exam approach uh, where you may or may not wanna give them feedback, uh, that's kind of a decision of what you decide if it's important enough that they get that. So for example, if if a student fails a particular station at a skill acquisition, you know, I, it's likely that you want to give them some feedback as to why they failed. Um, but that's a decision that you make with, um, you know, within your program. So in terms of iterator reliability, um, you know, it's just, you know, simple exercises like this one. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, and so some of you are seeing a skull very clearly, and then some of you are actually seeing the woman that's in the mirror who's, who's putting on some makeup, right? And then once you see both of them, it becomes very difficult to unsee the other one. So, but you had different perspectives as you came in, same thing as what you would do here, right? So what is this? Is that guy? Or is it a man and a woman? standing next to each other. Who knows, right? Uh, yes, it's to both. But this is the same concept that we have in terms of iterator reliability. We don't, um, with without really working you, with your instructors, if you're just assuming that everyone's going to sing from the same page, it's a bad assumption to make. Um, you know, I have, I have some highly experienced instructors and I have new instructors and I even have just postgraduate students come back and help out in the lab. Um, and it's, uh, and, and we always meet a few minutes early. We always sit down and talk about like, what are we doing today? Right. They already gotten the lesson plan in advance. Uh, but I'll have the materials out and said, remember, so these are the key points and this is how we're going to teach this. And I know that maybe you do this differently in the field. You know, and I'm not going to pass judgment on that, but I, for the classroom, we want to do this unless we feel that that's not right and we want to do this, right? And so we talk about it as a group, and that's how we sort of try to standardize that part of the lab. So we clarify each of the objectives. We do, if, if, if I have you instructors with me, um, I'll ask them to come a few minutes early so that, that we can practice a skill together. So I want to make sure, number one, they can do it. I assume that they can, but it's an assumption. But I want to make sure that they can do it the way that I want them to do it, as opposed to the way they think that they should do it. Um, and uh, and then we set goals. So the like, OK, so you know, for, for this part of the lab, we want them to repeat that skill 20 times each. 10 times, whatever the number is, once they've gotten to the basic acceptable step so that the instructors know that they have a time frame in order to get this stuff accomplished um, and they'll, they'll judge their, pro their progress appropriately. Um, some things about equipment and environment. 
um, in general, you want this equipment to be adequate and you want it to be accurate. So whatever your systems are using, wherever your students graduate and end up going to work, you want to make sure that your mirror, your equipment mirrors it as best as possible. Uh, I totally understand the limitations associated with with finance and and uh, storage. Um, so uh, so you, you do the best that you can. You want to make sure that it is operable and that it's reliable. So it's really nothing more frustrating to have broken pieces of equipment around, even from a, just a pure marketing perspective. To have broken equipment sort of implies you don't care. At least that's how I feel about it. Um, and the students pick up on that. So you know, every semester I'm throwing away stuff that's broken, or trying to repair it, or trying to get replacements for it. I also work on a limited budget as well. Um, when it comes to repetitions of skills, um, there are lots of ways that you can do things cheap. So um, for example, I was gonna do this as a demonstration, but I was missing my, my little balloon. But if you look at this, this one on the left, so critical key step in IV access is the angle of attack, right? Of the, whoops, here it is. The angle of attack of the, of the needle, right? So I want them to practice this a lot. And I just want them to practice this piece first, right? So how to hold it at a specific angle and how do you get it in? But that's a lot of needles and that's a lot of poking at a plastic arm, right? And certainly we don't want them to be poking at each other. So um, this I found up on the web and was a great little device. All it is, is just a, a glove. And there's a, you can get 20, you can get 20 of these. Um, let me put it down here. You can get about 20 of these for about a buck, right? Every student makes their own where they just literally put the, the balloon into the glove and then they blow it up. But before they blow it up, there's a tiny little balloon here that's filled with fluid. And the, once it's all blown up, there, this is of course not anatomically correct and I don't care, right? It doesn't feel right and I don't care. What I do care is that now they have a hand that they can practice with the IV and they can practice 10, 20, 30 times at the right angle with somebody watching them. They pull, they just poke it in, pull it out, poke it in, pull it out, poke it in, pull it out. And then all they're doing is just practicing the angle of attack, the amount of push that it requires to get the, the bevel into the system, right? That's all I'm asking them to do. But in our lab practice items where we're, they're teaching, learning about IVs for the first time, that's really critical, it, uh, that first step. So by the time they've done with their first lab, they will have poked something as they built into the skill, probably no fewer than 30 to 50 times, right? Just to get that sense of where their hand position needs to be, their finger position and all of that. Um, the one on the right is for wound packing. Um, right? And again, that's going out to find a cheap piece of meat um, and everyone wears gloves and we stick a little bit of an IV tubing that's inside there and, and then the students learn how to pack wounds over and over and over again. Um, it's pretty straightforward and then by the end you just toss it and pray that nobody tries to fish it out because you know they're hungry students. So in summary, this is... Um, uh, hopefully was helpful in terms of skills acquisition. It's a combination of all three domains and it is a series of steps that you kind of work your way through, right? It doesn't happen magically. It really happens in a stepwise fashion. Your practice, the practice of the students need to be deliberate to begin with. And then as they're working on their own, they stay deliberate with the goal um, that they have to get to. Um, it, you want to be able to they need to be able to demonstrate mastery of learning as they're progressing, because if they can't get the bottom steps done, it's very difficult to get to the top steps. <clears throat> Your feedback is precise and it's essential. Um, and uh, when it comes to evaluation, that's when you're setting the standard and you're saying, this is where, this is the pole in which we're gonna get you over. And I, you need to demonstrate that to me now. So it's not training. And in order to be good and consistent with your students, you're, instructors also need to be um, have good integrated reliability and that so that they are all scoring at the same level. I will stop here.
and this is my contact information. And uh, let me see if there's a question down below. Yeah, we had a, a request for if you have any websites or anywhere that you could recommend some resources for some of these things, or more specifically copies of detailed practical skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the, there are, so your, uh, if you're using a textbook, um, most of the publishers have series of skill sheets that have good detail to them. Uh, and th so that'd be sort of one place to look at. Uh, I think uh, if you're a NEMSI member, I, I have seen some things up on the trading site, although I know it's kind of hard to find them sometimes. Um, if yeah, And I'm happy to share you examples of what we have. Uh, I can get you a couple of different examples so you can get a sense of how we built ours. Uh, and um, so any of those, if you've, if you've got a paramedic program, the the baseline for this, uh, the baseline uh, for paramedic program is the registry portfolio, uh, which we have pretty much used um, for the most part. Uh, so there are a couple of different places where you can get that. Um, there's a question about, uh, let me scroll back up here. Um, thank you for the feedback. The, the, do you believe actual exposure plays a heavy percentage of understanding and retention? I'm not sure exactly what you mean, Charlene, by that. Um, exposure to the skill itself in a live setting or exposure uh, in the lab? Maybe you can clarify that for me. And just for uh, while we're handling that, I do want to just say to anyone who's in attendance, I sent um, Art's contact. The email is there, so you can copy that if you'd like to take that for later on. And also the link for CEUs. We're still taking some questions, so if you have anything yep. you'd like to send in, please go ahead and send those in. But um, if you do have to get up and get out of here after the end of the hour, uh, the link is in the chat that you can go and, and register for CEU. Great. So exposure in a live setting. Yes, I mean I think that it is important, right? And and um, I think being able to observe that is important. The question is um, whether or not that they are um, able to practice it. So the observation piece is nice, but they've got to be able to practice those skills. And um, you know we're sort of in an era now uh, in terms of healthcare um, that. Uh, to use patience alone um, in learning the skill is is not as acceptable as it used to be. I mean, I think that that's sort of uh, where medical schools have gone, nursing schools have gone. Uh, we're seeing this in allied health and in paramedic programs as well. Many paramedic programs no longer allow students to um, do IV practice on each other. Um, but there are institutions that felt that it's too much of a liability. And so, um, so simulation sometimes is your only choice, which means that you'll really have to um, create situations in which simulations are close enough to real life so that when they ladder over to live patients, that it isn't that far of a jump. And that is a challenge. Game learning type simulation, I, I think is great. I mean, I think that um, we, we, do, we do informal competitions a lot uh, and um, in, in simulations for a lot of these students is just a real live video game. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, they enjoy the fact that they, are, they get to be immersed in, in high fidelity simulations. And, and what I mean by that isn't necessarily big expensive mannequins. It's, it's just having the mindset of having training patients to be training volunteers to be patients, to make sure that they're acting in a good way, that their moulage is good, that they can act out uh, and, and be that patient. And then training my instructors to not be instructors. Please don't be instructors during the simulations. The simulations is all about the students and the patient, and you force them to interact with them. And once they kind of make that switch, the instructors just step back, they're safety officers, they make sure that nobody hurts each other. And then their job is to do the debriefing at the end to lead the debriefing. So when you're practicing skills in those environments, this is where students really get it. They like, I practiced this a hundred times, it was really great. 
uh, and now I'm in the um, I'm doing this simulation and it's a little dark and the guy's lying on the ground and it's dirty and it kind of smells and and I can't get the start. Oh, oh, what happened? Right. And so we talk about sort of how they have to to get past uh, what we practice, the basic skills and how they have to adapt those skills to make it happen. And they find that fun. They find that interesting. Mm -hmm.